record on this computer. Starting the webinar. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bonnie McDonald, and I'm the president and CEO of Landmarks Illinois, and very happy to welcome you to our Snapshots lecture series today. We're just going to give everybody about maybe 15 to 30 seconds to make sure that they have logged on, and then we want to start promptly after that. So, uh, of course, get yourself uh, settled and a quick orientation, of course, to uh, to the, the Zoom um, as you're looking at this here, you'll see if you look at your, your Zoom page, um, we are certainly accepting your questions via our Q&A at this point. So you can go to the bottom of your screen and ask us questions via the Q&A. We also have the chat feature. And right now, as I see the raise hand feature, so we'll be having a Q&A session at the end so that you can ask our distinguished speakers questions about their experiences using the River Edge Redevelopment Zone Historic Tax Credit or putting their, their developments together. Um, as you'll hear, one project uh, you know, is still underway and one project is done. So uh, just to say, we're gonna ask you all, uh, I believe you are, but um, you know, right now our speakers are, are going to see the webinar. We aren't gonna see you, but when, when and if we come back, we want to ask you to uh, certainly make sure that you are muted and that your camera is off at this point. So let's get started, everybody. Again, um, for those who may have logged on in the last few minutes, welcome to Landmarks Illinois Snapshots Lecture Series. I'm Bonnie McDonald, the President and CEO of Landmarks Illinois, and very proud to welcome you on behalf of our board and our staff. Um, and also, today we are joined by our distinguished partner, uh, AIA Illinois, represented by Stacy Thingston. And I wanna thank Stacy very much for all of the partnership that we received from AIA Illinois. And she'll be speaking a little bit later about the work that we're doing collaboratively on the legislation that you'll hear about today. So again, let's, let's dive right in because we have a lot to tell you today. And we are pleased um, to welcome our speakers. So I wanna get right to that. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with Landmarks Illinois, you know, we are a statewide nonprofit, non-governmental membership-based organization. And what we like to, to talk about our work um, or how we distinguish it is people saving places for people and with people. So today we're featuring some of those people um, that we're working with throughout our state uh, to ensure that we have the incentives that are needed to do this vital revitalization work uh, for our communities, um, which benefit the local community, as well as um, demonstrating that historic preservation is feasible and important for creating um, arts programming, as well as affordable housing, as you'll hear. Um, the way that we do this work, of course, is, uh, is by the support from our members. We are a membership-based organization, and you all on the line here that are members, thank you so much. You make our work possible. So I want to recognize you, and today, if you are not a member or a supporter of Landmarks Illinois, I certainly hope that you are compelled uh, to find a way to support our work, whether that's through your engagement um, with our e-blasts that are free through social media and sharing the information that we put out on social media, like the call to action you'll hear about later for the RERZ State Historic Tax Credit. Um, but additionally, you can make a donation to one of our appeals. Right now we have um, on our website a donate button. Uh, our website is at landmarks.org, or you can also become a member of the organization um, by clicking on the join button at our website. Again, landmarks.org. Um, please mark your calendar. We have two events that are coming up and I hope that you join us. Uh, the, the first is a little bit later in June, um, happening on Wednesday, June 23rd. We will have the 50th annual, annual meeting of Landmarks Illinois. This is our 50th anniversary this year. And our members and guests are invited to join us as we report on the activities and successes of our 50th anniversary year. Um, and this is also where our members have the opportunity to vote on our board of directors. So I hope that you'll join us. Again, it's Wednesday, June 23rd, starting at noon. This is a virtual presentation so that we make it accessible to anybody in the state and the nation to join us. So it's easy to log on, have lunch with us and, uh, and hear about our work. 
Um, our other event that I would like to tell you about is our next Snapshots lecture, which is on Thursday, June 10th. There we will be talking about Altgeld Gardens, Preservation and Environmental Justice. For that Snapshots lecture, um, we want you to learn the history of the development and design of Altgeld Gardens, which is a Chicago Housing Authority owned housing community on the city's south side. Now it was built in World War II to house African-Americans who were working on the war effort as well as their families. Um, it has been home to hundreds of families for nearly eight decades at this point. So that is an important part of its history, but also something that, that folks may not know about Altgeld Gardens, it's also known as the home of the environmental justice movement with the founding of the People for Community Recovery, otherwise known as PCR in 1979 by Hazel Johnson. It was aimed, that organization was aimed at addressing the mental and physical toll for Altgeld Gardens residents um, living within the Lake Calumet and the Little Calumet River industrial area which, um, as we know, is contaminated with uh, pollutants from factories, landfills, as well as a massive uh, sewage treatment plant nearby. Um, so Hazel Johnson's PCR advocated for the closure and cleanup of facilities that were polluting Altgeld Gardens. Um, so today, PCR's work is continued by her daughter, and next month's lecture is going to feature her, Cheryl Johnson. So let's move on to today's lecture, and I hope, again, mark your calendar for those. Uh, but today's lecture, we are so proud to feature projects uh, that are using or will use the River Edge Redevelopment Zone tax credit. Um, the River Edge Redevelopment Zone tax credit, it's a mouthful, R-E-R-Z is what we'll call it, um, is a vital economic tool that Landmarks Illinois and our partner AIA Illinois advocated for for several years. Uh, and since its passage in 2010, this credit has fostered the reuse of historic buildings in five cities across our state. Um, to date, the credit has, um, has helped 32 projects, representing over $295 million in investment that has been completed because of this program, and with an additional $325 million in projects in the planning phases. So today you'll hear about two projects. Our first speaker will talk about a project that is, um, that is proposed in East St. Louis. And I'm pleased to welcome Yafet el who will discuss the redevelopment of the Broadview Hotel. Um, you might remember the Broadview Hotel as it was listed this year on our 2021 Most Endangered Historic Places list. And that's not because the, the development itself is not wonderful and sustainable. We know that it is, but it's because the RERZ credit is threatened um, to actually sunset at the end of this year. So it's really the program we're trying to bring attention to by raising the Broadview Hotel. And we're so pleased to work with Yafet and her team. We're also welcoming Kirk Albinson, who is here to talk about the Aurora Arts Center, which was a 2020 Richard H. Three House Foundation Preservation Award winner. Now, our first speaker, we're going to prioritize Yafet El Amin. She's the president and CEO established, um, who established Efficacy Consulting and Development in 2007, which is a minority and female owned company with a focus on building working relationships with area stakeholders that enhance and increase the overall vitality, vitality of the community, excuse me. Um, Yafet brings decades of local community understanding and knowledge accumulated from her past tenure as in the Missouri legislature, as well as her active guidance and leadership in providing training and increased business and workforce opportunities for minority businesses and workers in the St. Louis area. So please welcome our distinguished speaker, Yafet Alamin. Yafet? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Bonnie, for uh, that introduction. And, and thank you again for Landmark Illinois uh, opportunity today to talk more about the new Broadview development and, of course, uh, efficacy consulting and development role in affordable housing and in the uh, state of Illinois working with this historic project. So I'm going to get screen here. Can you all see my screen? There we go. 
All right, so again, thank you for the opportunity to speak about the uh, New Broadview uh, development, which is a development located in uh, East St. Louis, Illinois. And um, I'm fortunate enough today to talk a little bit more, uh, not only about the New Broadview, but of course, uh, my company, Efficacy Consulting and Development. And as you intimated uh, earlier that uh, I have had some extensive uh, opportunities to work very closely with the minority and um, disadvantaged community as a former legislator in the uh, Missouri House of Representatives. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm back in the legislature today as we are watching the uh, River's Edge bill work its way through the legislature. And so being able to communicate with Frank, it made me feel again like I was back on the floor of the house, you know, uh, hoping that people do the right thing. But I'm extremely optimistic and I believe that we are definitely going to get there. But uh, my service there has extended more into public and private sectors. And I had a great opportunity in 2011 to work with the Missouri Housing and Development. Development Commission, which is uh, Missouri's counterpart to Illinois' um, the, uh, Housing and Development uh, Agency, IDA. And uh, in 2007, I began to further my company's relationship with the community by the expansion of affordable housing and, and working on projects uh, in the state of Missouri. Uh, now we are, of course, are working on the new Broadview project in Illinois and working with another uh, nonprofit in the state of Oklahoma. So it's always a great opportunity to be able to advance uh, housing for working people throughout the United States. I am also a mother with two children, um, Hassan, who is 20 at the University of Houston, and I have a budding 16-year-old. So continue to pray for me uh, as we get through the teenage years. Uh, efficacy Consulting and de Development. Efficacy, of course, is the, means the ability to produce a desired result. Um, and efficacy has stood very firm with uh, urban development in working with uh, the needs of urban communities. Uh, we utilize strate strategic and holistic ways of finding and creating sustainable solutions uh, for underutilized sites in the, in the urban core. And we're proud to continue to work with communities toward the revitalization of affordable housing uh, in those communities that we serve. Uh, here on the other side of the river, in which we call it, are several projects that Efficacy has participated on with afford affordable housing. Uh, the Village of Delmar Place, which is 40 um, single, excuse me, townhomes and garden homes uh, here to the left. Uh, Finney Place, which is a, a very a new development that we finished last year, which are uh, four, 40 single family homes, three and four bedroom homes for uh, growing families. I, I like to tell a quick story. Me as a, a, a young girl at one point, um, I have seven sisters, no brothers, but at one point, four of us were in one room together. My, car, my father's a carpenter by trade and uh, decided to finally build out the lower level of our home, which afforded us um, to have rooms two to a room. So I understand uh, what it's like to, to finally, as my older sister left to go to college to get my own room, but I understand what it's like for, for growing families and particularly young people to have their own space. And so this Finney Place development in essence was developed um, you know, and modeled after my own childhood and and, um, and, and the need for growing families to be able to have space to grow. Um, the Scott Manor development is a partnership with a, um, a church entity, Believers Temple uh, Word Fellowship, and it is also a senior development. Uh, my first one, and now as we're working on the new Broadview, which would be our second uh, senior development. Speaking of the new Broadview, here is this beautiful historic structure uh, that is sitting right on Broadway, uh, right off Barack Obama Boulevard in downtown um, East St. Louis, Illinois. It is one out of four buildings that the city of East St. Louis saw fit to put on the National Historic Register in 2013. We wholeheartedly believe that the new Broadview will serve as the catalyst to spur other economic development within the other three buildings that are located in downtown uh, East St. Louis. We started on this journey um, in August uh, 20, 
2017 with the idea from an economic development summit that uh, the former mayor Amika Jackson Hicks held in sending developers to come to the city of East St. Louis to, to work with that community. Uh, some of their uh, incentives were the tax increment financing, of course, the river's, river's edge in which we are talking about and trying to preserve today. Of course, uh, SWIDA and funding from SWIDA. And then of course, the uh, Illinois Historic Preservation Tax Credit Program. And so on October 13, 2017, the city uh, issued an RFP. And then in December 19, we were uh, selected and well on our way to, to try to revitalize this historic structure. What we have proposed to, to build or uh, to rebuild in this community and to reutilize in this community with this building is 110 uh, units of senior housing. Of course, this building used to be the old Broadview Hotel, uh, which was one of the city's first hotels. Um, and, and the first place that it housed is radio station, um, very prominent people such as Catherine Dunham utilized the seventh floor for um, ballet and dance instructions. Uh, the, uh, the, the university used it for over 20 years to advance community programs. So we are honored to be able to now take this building and provide for it to be a housing um, place and facility for people who have lived, worked, and want to continue to live in the city of East St. Louis. So uh, this facility will have 97 one bedroom units and 13 two bedroom units uh, serving households between 30% and 50% uh, AMI. We also are proud to, uh, to have set aside 10% of these units for our veterans and people who have served our country. Uh, the first floor of this building is, um, is going to be a great area to house a small grocery store, exercise facility, and a coffee and sandwich shop within this building. The lower level, and when you combine both of these spaces, we are close to 20,000 square feet of what we call community commercial space. And on the lower level, we will house a beauty and barber salon, a banquet and multi-purpose center, and even a minority business incubators as the city of St. East St. Louis uh, is really struggling to try to sustain and grow uh, minority businesses. So we, we are proud of the support that we've received from the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity to assist us uh, with this project. We will also have a senior technology center, of course, uh, bridging that gap of that digital divide that a lot of uh, seniors have within our community, a mega kitchen because we wanna keep them healthy and, and teach nutritional demonstrations to help ensure that um, these communities now are understanding and transitioning into to more healthier ways of living. And then um, a modern public space that we can house catering events and public community meetings and space for the whole community to use. So in, cre in creating this development, we, we actually felt that it would be the nucleus, if you will, uh, for the downtown revitalization and to bring people in the community back into the downtown area. Um, of, of course, um, I just talked about what will happen on those floors. Uh, floors uh, one, we are reestablishing the historic 18-foot uh, tall barrel vaulted ceiling uh, that had been removed when the university uh, took over the, the area. So we will bring that back to its historical uh, integrity. Floors two through six will be the apartment uh, floors for the seniors. Uh, we have taken the unique seventh floor, which used to be the ballroom that have really high ceilings and created a mezzanine level for loft style apartments um, and a great skyline um, that looks over the Mississippi River. So uh, we are excited about it. We do have support from the St. Clair County Housing Authority, which uh, they have committed 50 uh, project-based uh, rental assist assistance contracts contracts and vouchers to also assist uh, the seniors with any subse subsequent rental gap needs. 
As we talk about the capital stack, the project in totality will be about $34 million. Uh, $24 million of that will come from the private e equity uh, coming from the uh, low-income housing tax credit, as well as the historic tax credit, uh, about a $23 million hard construction cost. And um, we have sought out to Ida for an additional $4.4 for nine million for um, additional soft funds, and then 3.8 million in which the Department of Economic and Commerce and Opportunity has already awarded us the Shovel Ready Grant, and we are uh, waiting their results from the uh, Eco Devo grant that we submitted about six months ago. Um, the city of East St. Louis has already committed and we are in the final stages of the environmental remediation for the building as asbestos uh, was found and led in the building. So the city kicked in and, um, and, and dedicated $1.8 million to remediate the building. And I believe the remediation will be complete this month. All of these uh, entities have really come together to make our dream of the new Broadview a, a reality. So uh, again, I mentioned the remaining grant from the Department of Commerce, Economic and Opportunity. Um, we were projecting closing um, in July. We might, as, as we are still waiting on the grant, uh, push that back toward the, the end of the second quarter, um, but nevertheless, on target to start construction this year and to be completed the latter part of 2022 and then uh, moving into lease up after that. So again, um, efficacy has uh, been for several years working on connecting communities, bringing communities together, uh, bringing people together to, to better communities. And we appreciate all of the support that we have received from Landmark Illinois, as, uh, as you all have helped our voice become stronger, uh, connecting the city of East St. Louis with its other state counterparts, as we are on this journey together to ensure that uh, we sustain and, and edify uh, historic buildings uh, throughout the state of Illinois. So again, thank you to you all. We, of course, would like to thank the city of East St. Louis, uh, Mayor Robert Eastern, um, and the city manager and all of their council persons for their continued support of the new Broadview. And we are excited about what the remainder of the year has to offer for us. Thanks again. I'll stop sharing. Y'all said that was incredible. And you know, that is, you know, we, we can see the dream, we can see the aspiration and, uh, and know that clearly you've demonstrated it's gonna become a reality. So we're so honored to have you here as um, you. You know, a doer and a legislator, and you can teach us <laughs> a thing or two about getting people involved, uh, you know, in, um, in the activities, which we hope we will inspire people to do today. This is this is one part education, one part advocacy. So let's hope everybody Absolutely. stands behind the work that we need to do to make sure we get this bill that we're talking about across the finish line. So thank you um, for that inspiration. And uh, we wish you strength uh, with being a mom and a developer at the same time. So <laughs> thank you. We're, we're going to, you know, at this point, move on to our second speaker. So I am so pleased to introduce uh, Kurt Albinson as well, the Senior Project Manager with Community Builders, a national nonprofit real estate developer, owner and manager of mixed income and mixed use communities. Um, so Kirk leads um, origination, financing, design, construction, and stabilization activities for development opportunities in the Midwest. And Kirk, when I read that, you must be one tired man, because that is a big job description that you have there, what you are managing. Um, so what he brings to the table is experience managing complex developments utilizing the low income housing tax credits, new markets tax credits, as well as historic tax credits. So with this extensive background in architecture and construction, Kirk balances the drivers to create successful developments while delivering impactful community outcomes, as you will hear about today. So Kirk, we are so pleased to have you and to introduce you to talk about the project in Aurora. Thank you. 
Okay, thanks, Bonnie. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully, everyone can see it here. Uh, and first, a uh, little housekeeping. I got to apologize. Uh, working from home has its uh, advantages, but then, of course, uh, Murphy's Law would have it. If the neighbor decides to build his new garage right when the presentation starts. So if you hear any sighing or hammering in the background, it's it's uh, it's from me. So uh, thanks for your patience on that. Um, Want to give everyone a a, a a simple overview of the project that the community builders uh, developed in partnership with the city of Aurora and Paramount Theater in downtown Aurora called the Aurora Arts Center. Uh, and uh, just a quick background on the community builders, the organization I work with. We are a nonprofit real estate developer. We operate uh, between Chicago, DC, and headquartered in Boston, and 14 states in between. Uh, we've got a 50 year track record under our belt um, and developed over 25,000 units of uh, primarily mixed income and affordable housing with lots of other community type development uses, including what we'll see today. And about uh, six years ago, uh, the community builders started working with the city of Aurora to look for opportunities to help with their revitalization efforts downtown Aurora. And the project we'll look at today is the fruits of our labor uh, in partnership with the city and Paramount Theater, which is a quasi government agency under the city. Uh, quick background on the city of Aurora. Um, city of Aurora is uh, like many other Midwest uh, post-industrial communities where long time ago had its heyday, uh, was uh, um, a bustling industrial town uh, that thrived. And then in the 50s and 60s with, say, the, the, with the industrial uh, economy leaving the Midwest, uh, it hit hard times. And for decades, there was uh, quite a bit of disinvestment within the Aurora community. Fortunately, around 20 plus years ago, the city and um, local community leaders um, made a concerted effort to invest in the downtown. And fortunately for the city of Aurora, it's, it's one of the communities, you know, the reason why we're here today is to promote the River Entry Development Zone. Aurora is one of the communities that is able to take advantage of uh, that credit, which is effectively a state historic tax credit. And with that, yes. Oh, I'm, so so I'm so sorry, I thought there was a pause there. Just so you know that the, the slide is currently, it popped up on the presenter view. I don't know why it, it swapped around from when we tested it, but um, if the display settings, if you can swap it, or, you know, I have your pre presentation that you shared with me, I can share it and sure. slide. Hold on just a sec here. Sure. So the, the slide is not showing up, right? It's showing up as presenter view, you know, where we can see. Oh, I see. Okay, hold on. Hang on. Let's, let's stop it. Maybe it's uh, good everyone can see the precursor. Hold on. Try one more time. No trouble. All right, try one more time. Here we go. That was my mistake. All right, hopefully everyone sees one slide on their screen. That's great, thank you. Okay, thanks, Frank. All right, all right, hopefully everyone can see this better. So Aurora, um, great community, uh, last 20 years, been significant investment in their downtown. Uh, and and uh, a lot of it is uh, thankfully because of the River Edge uh, redevelopments on credits that were available which essentially was a boost in the arm to help promote investment into a lot of the just beautiful historic architecture that Aurora had at its uh, fingertips. Um, now, the benefit of all the investment in the downtown over the last couple of decades is that there's been just uh, beautiful buildings and community benefits that have come out of this. Uh, everything from uh, you know, new construction with, with civic architecture, such as downtown library, reinvestment into the Paramount Theater, which is just absolute jewel of a historical structure. Uh, and then uh, you know, development of new community uh, venues, such as the River Edge Park, but also just the, the um, significant number of beautiful uh, aging historic buildings in the downtown area, which is a historic district, benefit from the River Edge credit and the reinvestment. And we're fortunate to have a, a part in that process where we've identified uh, through exploring for opportunities to help with the revitalization, as I mentioned, with the city and Paramount Theater. Uh, we were lucky that the uh, two co-joined buildings, what, which, which we're now calling the Aurora Arts Center, uh, had sat vacant for six years. It would formally served originally as two department stores built back in the 20s, uh, and then for a number of decades had served as 
uh, be Wabanzi Community College, uh, their main campus in uh, downtown Aurora. They had built a new building just a block away and the building sat vacant. Um, you know, part of the challenge with taking a historic structure such as uh, the buildings that we redeveloped is uh, gorgeous buildings on the outside, but uh, very deep floor plates. Um, and in these, um, you know, smaller communities out in the far out suburbs uh, that, you know, struggling trying to consider redevelopment opportunities uh, since retail is not on the leading edge in uh, these types of communities, but also just trying to think through how do you take a, a building with such a large floor plate and consider effective redevelopment strategies where it truly can be a success and not, let's say, a, a flash in the pan. So uh, uh, just to jump right to the program and the design, um, we, were, we were lucky that the, the building is sitting immediately next to the Paramount Theater. And through our exploration of uses of the building, one of the goals of the Paramount Theater uh, was to develop a school of, of performing arts uh, to expand their offering to the community, but also to look for a permanent home for their rehearsal spaces uh, for um, their, um, their theater production at the theater next door, along with all their back of house uh, efforts. So here's a, a beautiful uh, picture of the building. Um, just to, you can actually see there's still <laughs> some construction equipment there as we are nearing completion on the building. Uh, and as I mentioned, two uh, buildings, actually the, if you can see down the street, there's a white terracotta building along with the building here at the corner. They were co-joined about 80,000 square feet uh, and had a little bit of a um, presented design challenge as a jigsaw puzzle. We benefit by having a great design construction and consulting team. Cordigan Clark as our architect, uh, McShane Construction, our general contractor, and McCroskey Historic Advisors uh, leading the charge on ensuring that we were doing everything appropriately to uh, capture our historic credits and, and to put the building on the National Register. Uh, but what we came up with in terms of a final program, and this is a floor plan showing the, the four different floors in the building, three above grade, one below, is to truly create an arts destination. So on the upper two floors of the building, which is um, the more of the cyan color at the bottom, um, we have 38 units of, of affordable artist preference housing. And then on the primary of the first floor and then the majority of the lower level, we have the School of Arts uh, with the Paramount Theater. We have their uh, back house rehearsal, theater support spaces, and also a, a fine dining restaurant, which was a um, um, something downtown Aurora had been lacking with the strong um, popularity of the theater program. And so uh, just another um, section view from the architect showing just sort of a little bit of the jigsaw puzzle that we had to come in and, and take these beautiful old structures that were a um, combination of steel and wood and really no, no uh, apparent, say, you know, defined structural grid pattern and trying to come in and carve out these spaces for these different uses. Um, so just a couple shots of the building during construction. Um, you know, one thing for the folks on the call, if anyone's embarked on these types of developments or will, um, you know, construction contingencies uh, around 10% or if you can put in more than 10%, you will use every penny once you, um, let's say, peel back the layers of the onion and discover what you have on your hands. Um, beautiful old building, but, uh, you know, definitely it was, um, it was a, uh, there was a lot of problem solving uh, when we went through construction, um, you know, columns and structural patterns that we did not know existed. And being able to create, uh, let's say, true um, effective program spaces for, especially for the school and the theater rehearsal spaces where they need large open spaces, tall ceilings, uh, we had to create those within the structure. Uh, just a, a quick side note for folks that are interested in historic credits. We, we actually had a, a little bit of bittersweet from a historic perspective. We had absolutely pristine uh, historic original exterior of the building, except for a number of the windows had been replaced. But otherwise the shell was purely intact. The interior of the building, the, the sad part was that over the decades, all of the historic, um, you know, original historic elements within the building had all been stripped away when it had been converted uh, over the years into a community college. But that also presented a little bit of a, um, a benefit for us as a, as a design and development and construction team is that we had a, a fairly clean canvas to work with on the inside of the building. Um, so now just to drill down into a little bit of some of the programs. So the upper two floors, as I mentioned, 
uh, 38 loft style apartments. We had tall ceilings, gorgeous Chicago style windows. We put in 38 units. Uh, and these are loft style units where the primary living area is on the frontage with the large windows, big daylight. But a lot of the bedrooms we put inboard where we have borrowed, what we call borrowed light. So they don't have, let's say a natural window or a, a window to the outside from the bedrooms, but they have a open space at the ceiling. So they qualify as a, a, a sleeping room. Uh, so we're able to fit in 38 units, very large units. A lot of the one bedrooms range anywhere from on the small side, 650 to 700 square feet. Some of the units, one bedroom units are 1,000 to 1,200 square feet. We have two two bedrooms in the upper floors. And the upper floors, uh, the, uh, the residential portion of the program was all designed around the arts. Aurora has uh, done a, a great job of promoting their arts and culture um, theme for their downtown um, and riding on the coattails of the success of the Paramount Theater. And we want to continue that, that theme and that success with the Art Center. So there is, these are all affordable units. Um, they have an artist preference, which means that if, if two people apply and one is, is an artist, then that artist will have a preference to be able to rent the apartment. And I can say which, in, uh, with, uh, as, a, as a testament to the success of the development, um, we initially were, when we were doing our market analysis, were concerned about the, being able to draw 38 dedicated artists out into the far Western suburbs of Chicago. Um, I can tell you right now, we have over 300, a waiting list of over 300 people waiting to get into this building. And every, every resident in this building is a professional artist, everything from performing arts to visual arts, uh, you name it. It's, it's absolutely just uh, amazing in terms of the quality of the folks um, that have been able to, to find housing here. And one of the fun things about this program is that we have um, all the amenity spaces are designed with artists in mind. So we have, um, uh, instead of your typical lounge space, we have a collaboration lab. Uh, we have an art gallery where artists can show their work, uh, which is right there on the screen, the bottom left. Um, we have music practice studios. We have movement studios uh, or movement studio in the building. Um, so we want to be very intentional and not just, let's say, you know, put a stamp of, you know, here's an arts building, but we want to be very intentional about the usability of the spaces in the building. Moving ahead, um, it's just a couple of pictures of the finished product, um, uh, but uh, gorgeous, like I mentioned, just uh, large windows, lots of daylight, clean finishes. Um, it really is just a, a um, beautiful spaces for folks. So just to wrap up on the lower half of the building, the primary first floor and the majority of the lower level are for, we're calling it commercial program, but it's primarily the School of Performing Arts, uh, with the Paramount Theater, the Paramount Theater, back of house function, and a fine dining restaurant. And this is really where the, the, uh, the challenge came into in dealing with structure and, and program needs, et cetera. But the resulting product is gorgeous. We, we literally uh, <laughs> dug down uh, into the foundation. We removed a lot of the columns in certain areas to be able to fit in a flex studio, dance studios, uh, performing spaces, rehearsal spaces. And here's just a handful of some photographs of the finished product, everything from a welcoming lobby. Um, users are everything from toddlers uh, in arts programs through the primary uh, population of the, the folks using the school are primarily uh, student age uh, kids. And then, but there's adult programs all the way up to seniors. Um, so it's just a fabulous outcome. Um, you know, one <laughs> uh, unfortunate news, right when the school had opened, the pandemic hit. And so just as they were getting going, they had to hit the pause button on the program, but they're excited to get things rolling uh, later this year as things uh, loosen up with the uh, restrictions. And then a, a last piece, just in, in terms of the, uh, the explanation point on the development, uh, we dedicated space at the hard corner, if you remember from the rendering, uh, for a fine dining restaurant. Um, Paramount Theaters had over 400,000 annual subscribers to their program for a number of years, but not a lot of dining options uh, downtown for either pre or post uh, production. And so we we're very fortunate that uh, Amy Morton, a uh, famed uh, local restaurateur, uh, who is a, a thespian at heart, joined forces uh, with our team to open up a, a, a fine dining restaurant, which we're very proud of. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, literally within a couple months after getting started, pandemic hit and we had to uh, uh, 
let's say closed the doors temporarily on the restaurant, but Amy's excited and has plans to get the restaurant back open uh, later this year once Paramount has shows coming back online. But uh, Stolp Island Social House, if you Google it, look it up online, uh, is um, a wonderful restaurant, uh, rave reviews with uh, the, um, the decor and the environment and the food. Um, and uh, that's all I have in the presentation. I, you know, I'd be happy to share some more details with the team through q and One thing I'll conclude on, which I didn't have a slide here, I didn't want to scare anyone, but the, you know, just to conclude on the River Edge credits, it was a critical piece of our funding. Um, and it is truly one of the important elements that allowed this project to move forward. This project consisted of low-income housing tax credits uh, that were awarded from IDA. We had new markets tax credits. Uh, we had federal historic tax credits, uh, capital development uh, block grant funds, multiple sources of TIF funding. Um, we had contributions from our investor from Paramount Theater, City of Aurora. Uh, but but uh, we had roughly three and a half million of River Edge redevelopment zone credits in this building. And we were concerned that you know without that source, this project would not have been able to be a reality. So. I would just want to highlight the importance of this credit for projects like this and the impact that they can have on the communities that, that we all just love. And, and going through a downtown like Aurora with these beautiful historic structures, it is truly turned into a destination. It is something, it's a draw for all the Western suburbs. Compared to 30, 40 years ago when there was the disinvestment, we had all these vacant storefronts. Um, it is absolutely amazing to see what the impact of, of the River Edge credits and just the investment in our, our historic infrastructure, uh, the benefit it can provide to these communities. So with that, I thank you for your time and I'll pass it back to Bonnie. Eric, actually, I'm gonna jump in. Um, thank you so much for uh, that, that great presentation showing what the River Edge Redevelopment Zone Historic Tax Credit has done and, and uh, Yafet, uh, what it will be doing, what it is doing um, and I am very pleased to be joined here by Stacey Fingston. I should say I'm Frank Butterfield, director of the Springfield office for Landmarks Illinois. Hello. And I'm pleased to be joined by Stacey Fingston, executive vice president of AIA Illinois. Um, our, our partnership between Landmarks Illinois and AIA Illinois has been uh, key in the past uh, to enact programs like these historic tax credits and um, is as strong as ever to retain and expand uh, these credits. And um, with, with uh, our members and supporters on this, uh, this, uh, for this lecture, I know you love hearing about uh, what, what these programs uh, can do and are doing, but I, I know you love even more uh, how to be involved, how to take action. So our part here is to, to, to help um, you become involved and uh, to retain and, and save these uh, important uh, programs. So what I want to start off with, and I'm gonna turn it over to Stacy for ways you can, you can help, but is to call out what our, 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 main, um, our main piece of legislation is right now. And that is, as you can see, SB 0157, Senate Bill 0157 in the Illinois legislature. So that is the bill that would extend the River Edge Redevelopment Zone Historic Tax Credit, the program as we just heard, but for these projects would not go through. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump to that, that last point there. The, the legislative deadline for, for these bills is May 31st. Uh, it's the next 10 days. So we are in the, the, the frantic, active, uh, every voice matters part uh, of, of the legislative session. Um, and as such, we are seeing a little dynamism on, on these pieces of legislation just this morning, um, we we uh, we learned that uh, that this bill has been um, is proposed to be amended, uh, adding in some technical corrections to uh, our statewide historic tax credit program. You might be familiar, Landmarks Illinois have, with AIA Illinois helped pass a statewide historic tax credit program uh, that's available all across Illinois. That one does have a, a, a cap per project and, an, and a yearly cap. Um, but there are some technical fixes that are now included with this extension to RERZ historic tax credit. There's also some debate going on right now via this amendment of how long the RER, RER historic tax credit, RERZ, excuse me, historic tax credit extension would be. Um, but all that to say, 
SB0157 is our right now our vehicle. This is the one that you can be an advocate for uh, retaining and extending the RERZ historic tax credit and improving our um, statewide historic tax credit uh, program. So I'm going to turn it over to, to Stacy uh, on ways you can you can really help uh, keep these programs going. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me today. And thanks to Frank and Bonnie. Uh, we couldn't do uh, our work without them on historic tax credit advocacy. Uh, AIA Illinois is the state's uh, organization's uh, watchdog at the Capitol. And uh, we look uh, at an over about a thousand bills a session. We don't do this alone. Uh, we have a great lobbying team. Uh, we also have an industry coalition we work with. And then Landmarks Illinois, we work with as our advocacy partner on the tax credits. But uh, it's a lot. Uh, but we are protecting the profession. We are looking out for the best interest of our architects, our developers, our partners um, in the work they do uh, for the architecture uh, industry. A uh, few things that you can do very easily, and, and they do matter. Uh, we set up something, a form-based email you can send out to your legislators today. I'm going to put that right here in the chat. And it's on our website, AIAIL.org, and it's under Advocacy Take Action. But I just put the link um, in the feed over here on the side. And um, that is very easy to do. You can send it to all your friends, your network. Um, these emails matter and they need to hear from us because our legislators are looking at, like I said, thousands of bills and hundreds are about to hit the floor and are currently hitting the floor in both the House and Senate. As Frank said, we've got about 10 days left of session. So it is a race to the finish and we are going to succeed in passing SBO 157, but we can't without your support. So the take action is in the feed. And also I will say an old fashioned phone call to your rep's office. It really matters and it literally speaks volumes. Uh, if they even get just a couple calls about a bill, it will put it on their radar. And it's a simple request or an ask. You wanna keep it very simple, you know, say, you know, I'm calling as a, your constituent, we really need your support on SB 0157, the RERZ Historic Tax Credit Extension. Um, it is vital to the economy and our local economies right now. It's a great tool um, in recovery for the uh, pandemic. Um, it is vital, these projects that I saw today, you know, the EFET, you know, is, is wanting to do in East St. Louis. Um, she can't do it without this credit. So do it for EFET. Please call these uh, reps of yours. Uh, please email them. And, uh, and it matters. Like I said, it only takes a couple calls. It only takes a few emails to get this to their attention and put it on their radar. So please help us. Uh, please get the word out to your networks and your friends and your partners uh, that we need to pass this tax credit this session. Uh, thank you so much for that, uh, Stacy. Um, and th that way folks can, can know that, you know, uh, years from now when they're hearing about more of these these projects and, and that they, they had a part in, um, in, in saving this credit. Uh, we're gonna open it up for questions. People can see um, there's a Q&A down below as well as the chat. And, and while uh, you're thinking about typing in a question, I just wanna note that um, these, these, this, this snapshots program um, is, is not possible without support of our members, as Bonnie noted. We encourage you all to join as well as our annual corporate sponsors. Uh, you can see here um, that because of their support, we're able to offer educational and advocacy programs such as this. So I'm going to stop screen sharing so I can see the questions, but um, if anything's come in thus far, um, but I will also, I, I just wanted to um, um, note, we have a lot of expertise here between the, the, the uh, project, uh, running, running these projects like Kirk and, and Yafet have done, but also um, legislative uh, experience between Yafet's time in the Missouri uh, legislature, although I don't know if uh, Missouri and Illinois, it seems might be uh, a little different. Every state's a little different in how they, they do things. Um, but I'll ask a question to, to kind of get it started too. Um, Kirk, before we were, we were live here, we were noting that some of these amendments right now are talking about shortening the extension to you know, three years potentially versus the initially proposed five-year extension. Can, can you speak to, you had some comments about um, uh, what that, that timeline of these projects and how much 
um, that, that certainty and knowing a, a program is there matters to a developer going forward. It does, yeah. And, um, you know, we, we I know we were talking before we started that we, we don't want to, we, we're happy to take anything we can get, but it, the challenge in doing a large scale historic development is that they, they need a long runway, you know, both pre-development and then also during construction. And we had the same issue uh, back when we were teeing up the Aurora Art Center is that there was a sunset on the River Edge program. And actually we were, we were very blessed and we felt honored that at that time, Governor Rauner actually flew to Aurora to sign the extension and gave uh, the head of our development team the, the pen he used to sign the extension. Uh, and, and we used Aurora Art Center was a testament to you know, the importance of extending that program. But, but the challenge is, you know, we take Aurora Art Center, which really, it, it was a complex deal from a financing and design and construction, but um, we, we felt like we did it fairly efficiently in terms of the timing from inception, let's say back in 2015, second half of 2015, we closed just over two years later, uh, closed on our initial funding that allowed us to start construction. So within about 24 to 28 months, uh, we were able to close, but the, we had to hit the pause button during that process when we were unsure of the extension of the River Edge credit. Um, and so, but having that a longer time frame to have the credit in play allowed us to ensure that we had the time to do our pre-development, get our, our investments, our funding lined up, but then also the execution to allow us to complete the work. And the challenge with a three-year uh, program, although it's it's helpful, you know, it, it does um, force us to rethink our financing strategy because everyone's going to want to make sure that we're you know, we've got hard commitments on these these sources in any type of development. So it's a challenge with three or five years definitely provides more wiggle room for folks like you know you know, that's looking at a really um, you know quite a large project uh, because you just need that time to be able to, to tee up a deal I'm sure you've got your everything put together go through your part one part two approvals permitting get it completed. Um, and then, you know, being able to capture those, the, the benefit of those tax credits. And, uh, Yafet, um, uh, with, um, I have a question here about, uh, when we talked about these capital stacks and there's, there's multiple sources of financing and timing issues, and it's, it can be very confusing even to those who us, who of us do this professionally when, when communicating with, uh, a, a legislator, um, how best can people, um, uh, sort of drill down on, on what makes these, these, this program important and, and, and why it should be extended. How do we make that, that complex issue uh, simple and straightforward for a legislator? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good question. Um, I just like to say the easiest thing for me is, is connecting it to the people and the people matter. So at the end of it, we're, you know, when I look at the broad view, that's 110 seniors. They vote. Those people matter. You, you want to keep good people in your community. So I would, first of all, go back to the people and, and, and that being the root. There's two things that politicians understand is people and money, right? And so for, for these projects, it's really about the people. So when Kirk talks about his project, I think there were 39, 40, 40 lost, those 40 families who are now um, coming to that community. So my, my first point of entry um, to people who are uh, elected to serve us is really about what's the best route for the people. And, and clearly I agree with Kirk, three years and you saw it on my presentation, my our initial RFP uh, when we were awarded, that was in December of 2017. We're, we're now in May of 2021. So we're, we're, we're on the three year mark. So if it's about long term stability for communities and growth for communities, the five year is a light. You know, we really need 10 when you're really talking about truly redeveloping communities. And, and you look at the community plans, they're forecasting 10, 20, 30 years out. So you want your financial tools to match the forecast, right? You, 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 don't, you don't put ingredients together without any money to go to the grocery store, right? So, you know, I think it's as, as simple as that. So I think leaning in to them about the people and increasing opportunities for people to live and, and to live uh, in a holistic ways, everybody deserves it. I think that's a great answer, uh, putting people 
first uh, landmarks my tagline people saving places for people and we're trying to center the the people for whom these places matter um, Kirk, there's a question here about what uh, type of private investors contributed to the art center. And for the fundraising, uh, were both buildings combined into one entity when, when calculating the, the expenditures, the qualified rehabilitation expenditures for the project? So great questions. I would say if we had a good solid hour, <laughs> we could get into the financing in the art center. It was not, uh, like I mentioned, it was not for the faint of heart. So, um, just answer quickly, and I can I can give a little more context. Uh, we had um, the private investment. We actually had to, to funnel things through a couple different creative uh, ways. But uh, we had the Paramount Theater, which uh, had a capital campaign program, and they committed over a million dollars to the project. The total development cost was just over thirty-one million or so. Uh, but they had a um, uh, contributions from their their donor base um, and a, a commitment that they made actually, but we routed that through uh, Section 108 loan from HUD uh, that the city was able to secure. Um, so without getting those complexities, but and then our investor who is U.S. Bank on uh, all of the tax credits we had federal, historic, state historic, low income housing tax credits, new markets tax credits, donation tax credits. Um, they they had put in a donation as well of, of capital uh, into the development and including which for folks in the development side that are familiar with low income housing tax credits, uh, TCB, the community builders, we had uh, deferred developer fees uh, in the development as well. And um, we had uh, we had contributed uh, 1.25 million of NSP2 funds, which which came from HUD but we're at TCB's discretion on making investments. So I don't know if I'd qualify that as a private investment per se, but, um, uh, and the, the, the answer to the, about putting both or the buildings into one entity, it was a jigsaw puzzle, both physically, as we, you know, we looked at with kind of figuring out the program out of it, but also financially. So even though we had two co-joined buildings, which uh, for those that do, historic work, uh, essentially we had to get two part ones, two part twos, two part threes, uh, but we actually uh, financially, we split the physical project horizontally. So we had a commercial condo for the um, commercial uses and a residential condo. And that allowed us then to uh, more easily and, and from a, just a legal and financial standpoint, stream in all these various sources. So we actually have a, a condominium structure in the building that allows us to do a low, a low income housing tax credit deal on the upper floors and a new markets tax credit deal on the bottom floors. But it really got, um, in fact, I think one of the attendees is uh, Rachel Friggins with McCrossey, um, having, having expertise involved to help navigate all the historical nuances of trying to take that complex, complex approach, but then also just having the horsepower financially to be able to navigate all those nuances was quite a challenge. Thank you so much. Um, and I just want to remind people that the RERZ, um, that, 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 that historic tax credit is available in uh, Aurora, Elgin, Rockford, Peoria, and East St. Louis. Uh, as I noted earlier, we have a state historic tax credit, which we will uh, continue to work on uh, expanding, uh, remove, raising, and maybe perhaps eliminating those caps someday. Um, but also just looking at the time, I think uh, I think we're just about at the end here. I want to thank so much uh, Yafet and Kirk for, for their time and expertise and their fantastic projects, which we want to support in any way possible. And right now, support is through this extension. Uh, Stacy, any last remarks? Please take action. I put it again uh, in the chat feed, a uh, quick link, and it'll only take you about 30 seconds to fill out and uh, send an email to your rep today. So please do that, or please call your rep's office. It's really important. And any additional questions, feel free to reach out to any of us um, after the, uh, the, the lecture here. And uh, thank you so much for participating. We hope to see you at future Preservation Snapshots lectures. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.